Welcome everybody to this third session of these uh, conversations uh, between Instituto de Salud Carlos III and IARC, Institute of, uh, the uh, International Agency for Research in Cancer. And I just want to just very briefly remind everybody that the, the idea of these conversations was to improve the collaborations uh, between uh, EC and IARC, but also just to, 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 to let the people know, to, 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 to publicize a, a bit the terrific work that has been doing it at IARC and also the research that has been doing at EC and also initiatives that are financed by EC but not uh, doing in, in house. So just with this, I just will leave the floor to Marina Poyan, who is the uh, director of the National Epidemiology Center and also the director of the Cyber of Epidemiology of, and Public Health. But she has many charges. I didn't want to mention all of them. She knows very well IARC and she knows very well ISTI. So I'm really happy that she can join us today as the chairman. So Marina, it's up to you. Thank you very much, Pilar. Good morning, everybody. I think that, well, as Pilar mentioned, this is the third webinar included in the series conversations of Instituto de Salud Carlos III International Agency for Research on Cancer. And I think that we have a very trendy topic today because there is a wide interest in diet. People normally are asking for specific foods or nutrients that may as uh, healthier, even happier. <laughs> so, and we see uh, news in the newspapers and in the media uh, reporting uh, results from different studies of how good is this particular nutrient is. So, I think that um, today is a very exciting uh, webinar. And we are pleased to have very, uh, two very good expert, experts on the matter. Uh, we have Professor Miguel Angel Martinez here from ISTI. He belongs to the Ciber of Obesity and Nutrition. I don't know for, uh, if Mark knows what Ciber is. Ciber is a big network of excellence in Spain. In, it includes different areas of research. There are almost 500 groups of research in, included in, in Ciber. Um, one of the areas of Ciber is obesity, obesity and nutrition. Um, Miguel Angel Martinez is a key uh, researcher in this, in this area. And on the side from, from IR, we have a Dr. Mark Gunther, where he said me just before that it's pronounced cancer or something like that. From IR, he is leading the section of nutrition there. So I will formally present both of them, giving some ideas of their curricula. Um, afterwards, uh, each of them is going to present their lecture of 30 minutes each. Um, uh, uh, when they finish, both of them, we will have time for the audience to, to make questions, to raise questions or comments or whatever. And the questions can be... Uh, Stated in Spanish, state in Spanish or in, in English. Um, uh, for Mark's sake, we will translate as best as possible uh, those who are, uh, are reading in, in Spanish. So, beginning with Miguel Angel Martinez Gonzalez, he doesn't need presentation in Spain, but he's a medical epidemiologist. He's a professor of public health at the University of Navarra. I mentioned he's a member of Ciberón. OBN, and he's also adjunct professor of nutrition at Harvard TH School of Public Health, the Department of Nutrition. He has spent more than 30 years researching the determinants of chronic diseases with a strong focus in nutrition. He's the PI of large trials and cohorts, such as the SAM study, that is very well known here, and very successful diet person studies, such as PREDIMED and PREDIMED Plus showing the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. With Frank Hu in Harvard, thanks to NIH funds, she, he is uh, assessing metabolomics in the context of the PREDIMED trial. Everybody here knows and recognizes what Miguel Angel has achieved. He is an inspira inspiration for many of us as a researcher 
As a teacher, he founded the Department of Preventive Medicine and Public Health at the University of Navarra and has taught there a whole generation of epidemiologists. And also he's, uh, uh, he's uh, a well, uh, uh, well-known people among the general public because he has made an effort to translate the knowledge of, of his research to, the, to, the, to our society. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Mark Kancher. Uh, he holds a PhD in molecular epidemiology from the University of Cambridge and a degree in biochemistry from the University of Oxford. He completed his postdoctoral training at the U U uh, United States NCI and has held faculty position positions at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York and Imperial College in London. His research focuses on the role of nutrition, diabetes, and obesity in cancer with an emphasis on metabolic dysfunction and the insulin IGF mTOR pathway. He is a coordinator of the European Prospective Investigation into Cancer, a peak study, everybody knows a peak here, Spain participated, but for those who hasn't heard about a peak, it's a multinational cohort of over 500 to 20,000 European, and, is a, and he also is a committee member of the NCI cohort consortium, which includes over five, 50 prospective cohort studies worldwide. He serves on numerous committees and panels for international organizations such as the World Cancer Research Fund. So I finish here the formal presentation. A Miguel Angel, you have the floor to present your lecture. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Marina, for your kind introduction. It is a great pleasure for me and an honor to do this presentation. So um, uh, my, the, the title is of the presentation is the importance of diet and cancer and other chronic disease. Uh, but I will focus mainly on PREDIMED and PREDIMED Plus. So uh, this is the outline that I'm going to follow. Uh, I, will, I will focus on the CBD, cardiovascular disease results in PREDIMED and PREDIMED Plus. We have only interim results because this is an ongoing trial. And uh, I will deal with published studies on cancer in PREDIMED. There are not very many uh, on PREDIMED and other uh, cohorts and uh, some review and highlights at the end. So starting with PREDIMED. Uh, the important thing here is that most of the studies uh, relating diet with health outcomes have followed observational designs for heart clinical events or randomized design only for intermediate markers. But seldom do we have a, a, a randomized trial with heart clinical events, especially when you deal with an overall dietary pattern. So this is the uh, the the scheme, the, the framework for uh, designing research on nutrition. And if you want to, to be here in a field trial for primary prevention with an overall dietary pattern, you have a, a big challenge because you, you need to tell participants that they are not going to eat what they like, but what the investigators say then to, to eat in breakfast, lunch, dinner. So is somebody so crazy as to do that? We were so crazy uh, to do that. Uh, and this is the, the, the strength of the PREDIMED trial. So in the PREDIMED trial, perhaps you already have seen this slide, we included men and women from 55 to 80 years old who, who were at high risk of cardiovascular disease, either because they were type two diabetics or they have three or more cardiovascular risk factors as you see in, in the slide. And we allocated then at random to three uh, dietary interventions. In the two first intervention, they receive instruction on Mediterranean diet. In the first, we uh, uh, provide provision of extra virgin olive oil, 15 liters every three months. In the second group, 
with uh, the provision, free provision of uh, three nuts for consuming 30 grams per day. And in the third group, that was the control group, we allocated them to a low fat diet according to the guidelines of the American Heart Association as, uh, as at uh, 2002, that was the time when we designed the, the trial. So, but the most important thing beyond olive oil and nuts was the overall dietary pattern. We recommended this dietary pattern to use exclusively olive oil for every culinary use, to consume four uh, tablespoons a day at least of olive oil, at least three pieces of fruit, two servings of vegetables, one of them as a salad, uh, one glass of wine every day, uh, three servings per week of uh, three nuts, three uh, per week at least of fish and seafood, uh, also three servings per week or more of legumes uh, to consume so free to at least twice per week to prefer poultry instead of red and processed meats and we discourage the consumption of sodas biscuits uh, commercial bakery red and processed meats butter margarine or cream so uh, this is what we call the 14 item Mediterranean diet adhering screener or midas this MIDAS has been endorsed by the American Heart Association and it is now widely used all over the world because it is a very fast uh, way of assessing diet in patients. For example, you have in the slide um, a screen capture of a hospital in Chicago where they routinely assess the diet of their participants and with this tool. In three, four minutes, you have an assessment of how, uh, uh, how is the adherence to the Mediterranean diet of a particular patient. So this is in Spanish. These are the seven uh, first questions of the 14 item score. And we have promoted uh, in the general public with these books, the explanation of these 14 points. These are the other seven points. So it is very, very easy, very fast. So at the beginning of the pre-med, this was the distribution from zero to 14 points in the, in the three groups. And when we look only at the two intervention groups, in one year time, we were able to shift the distribution to the right with a, a substantial change in the overall dietary pattern. This is the important thing of pre-med. So the, the, we derived this uh, score, this uh, system of scoring the adherence to the Mediterranean diet from a first case control study that we developed with myocardial infarction in Spain, in Navarra, uh, looking at the best discrimination points, cutoff points. And then uh, in the mean, they validated it with uh, objective biomarkers and then we validated it in the UK, in uh, Brazil, in Croatia, in Portugal, in Germany, in seven European countries, and very importantly in the United States with uh, metabolomics uh, and uh, machine learning, and also uh, with a replication in the nurse health study and the health professional follow up study. So. The, an important point in PREDIMED is that um, in Navarra, that was the Bangor center of PREDIMED, we started earlier the recruitment. And very importantly, we also stopped early, uh, completed early the intervention, uh, the, um, the completion of the recruitment. So uh, cancer has a long uh, induction and latent periods, and uh, we need to be patient in order to see the effects of intervention on cancer. So you have here the dates, the Navarra Center is the, the center with the largest uh, accrual of person times. Um, but this is with only considering the intervention period. If we go, the intervention lasted in Navarra, we completed the, the recruitment in 2005, all the centers completed then in 2009. So we have a very long follow-up period, but in addition, uh, we have also the ability of collecting events and we are completing now the collection of events up to 2021. So we'll have in a few months time uh, sufficient information on new cancers developed in the uh, 1,055 participants in the Navarra Center. 
So uh, the cardiovascular outcomes were published in 2013 in the New England Journal of Medicine. After three years, this paper uh, showing the benefits of the major diet on cardiovascular disease uh, achieved the, the, the number one according to all metric regarding the social and scientific impact after three years. And uh, in 2017, we received some unfounded criticisms and we decided to withdraw the original paper and to repeat the analysis, taking into account all potential criticisms. And together with a supplement of 100 pages, we published uh, then in the in the 2018 edition of the New England Journal of Medicine. And the results were basically intact after taking into account two issues that were the um, uh, inclusion of couples, husband and wife, for a single group instead of randomizing the husband to a group and the wife to another group. And in Sun Center, there was a small uh, subset of participants that were randomized in clusters instead of individually. These were the, the two, the two uh, uh, issues that we addressed here. So the, my, um, the, the primary endpoint was a composite of myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiovascular deaths. And you see in the, the unadjusted intention to treat analysis was the first analysis that we, we did in 2013. The adjustment takes into account the clustering effect and also the, the families. And uh, the results are very similar, only change in the second decimal place in one or two units. And when we excluded the sites with uh, uh, small clusters and the couples, uh, the results are even bit better. So uh, very recently, in this very month of May, uh, another group in Cordoba, uh, conducted a uh, independent replication of PREDIMED basically because uh, the protocol was very, very uh, similar to the PREDIMED also with the provision of olive oil. They have only two arms in the trial, not three arms. And they observe a very similar reduction in the risk of uh, reinfarction or other major uh, cardiovascular uh, heart clinical events in secondary prevention with more than 1000 participants after seven years of median follow-up. So this is very interesting because uh, they found very, very similar results. In fact, the dietitian came to Pamplona to learn the methods of the PREDIMED and they were also provided for free olive oil and a very similar dietary pattern that we use, the Mediterranean diet. They included a peripheral artery disease in the major outcome. This is a difference also with the PREDIMED. But uh, we also uh, publish in a, a separate report in JAMA and the results for um, peripheral artery disease that were also significantly reduced the risk with the Mediterranean diet, with the two Mediterranean diets, especially with the Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil. And also we found only for the extra virgin olive oil, uh, a, a significant reduction of 38% relative reduction in the risk of atrial fibrillation with the Mediterranean diet plus estrogen olive oil and no effect of the Mediterranean diet plus nuts uh, on the new cases of atrial fibrillation. In fact, we uh, took a lot of care in order to see the effect of estrogen olive oil on atrial fibrillation risk by uh, observing that there was a very nice dose response inverse trend between the amount of calories provided by extra virgin olive oil and the risk of atrial fibrillation uh, with uh, when the, the amount of calories was higher than 15%, the risk was significantly reduced. So uh, in addition, uh, this was also replicated in the, the this, uh, effect of the olive oil on cardiovascular risk in the nurse health study and the health professional follow-up study with the collaboration of Walter Willett and Fan Hu. Recently, Walter Willett became the number one in this ranking of top medicine scientists. Disappeared some days ago, and Fan Hu, number five. We were in the Vatican recently, together uh, studying with the Culinary Institute of America and people from the University of Davis in California, Yale University. So you see here Fan Hu, Walter Willett and Ramon Stuck, who was the promoter 
of the predimed. So there are the, uh, in science of olive oil, in nutrition, also in planetary health. So olive oil, when it replaced um, other fats, you see, these are the, the this is the same study in the Journal of American Co College of Cardiology. So uh, olive oil was always better, sometimes with wide confidence interval, for replacing other culinary fats. So we were right in PREDIMED in recommending olive oil for all culinary uses. So PREDIMED Plus, it goes uh, one step ahead because in addition to the Mediterranean diet, we want to know the effect of energy restriction if there is some uh, overweight or metabolic syndrome, physical activity, and a behavioral intervention with goals for weight loss. This was supported by the European Research Council in a grant that we received here at the University of Navarra from 2014 to 2019. So the main outcome was the primary endpoint was again the same that in PREDIMED, but this is was this was a new trial. And the control group now was the Mediterranean diet. So this is the idea of the PREDIMED plus to compare the traditional Mediterranean diet with no physical activity, no goals for weight loss, um, and no restriction in energy with uh, the three components of energy reduction, physical activity and goals for weight loss with a behavioral intervention. So the intervention will be maintained for six years. We started in Navarra in 2013, the other centers started in 2014, and the average follow-up time for clinical events will be eight years. So at the end of 2022, we will finish the intervention, and at the end of 2024, we will have the two additional years of observation. So this is the, the recruitment. Our initial goal was to recruit and randomize 6,000 participants, 3,000 in each group. Now we have almost 7,000. This is the mean follow-up and the expected end of the trial, eight years from randomization. You see the last participant will complete the eight years on December 23rd of 2024. So uh, these are the characteristics of the participants that you can see here. Uh, the average uh, BMI is almost 33. Uh, all of them have um, metabolic syndrome. The percentage of uh, type 2 diabetes is less than 30%. And most of them have hypertension and cardiovascular risk factors. So among the secondary endpoints, we have several cancers, gastric, lung, colorectal, breast, and prostate cancer. On a yearly basis, we are reviewing all the medical records of these participants to collect the data. So we will have the information on this effect on these uh, locations of cancer in the future. So we are using this, uh, instead of the 14 item uh, screener that we used in PREDIMED-1, we are using this 17 item screener. We have added these uh, more stringent goals for reduction in rest, processed meats, butter, margarine, cream, sugary beverages. We added the, the item of not adding sugar to beverage to reduce also white bread, to increase whole grains and to reduce uh, refined grains, rice and pasta. So we published an interim report in JAMA uh, three years ago. In this interim report, after one year, we saw that the intervention was effective in changing the overall dietary pattern, as you can see here, in the comparison of the 17 item in the, of the Mediterranean diet, energy reduced Mediterranean diet in the intervention versus control group. They were uh, almost uh, perfectly balanced at the beginning and the score was double, the change in the score was double in the intervention than in the control group. So if you look at the distribution, Ooh. it was very impressive how the uh, distribution of the 17 items uh, was shifted to the right uh, with the intervention and not in the control group. Uh, you see here how uh, it was very impressive the change that the dietitians with uh, monthly interviews and group sessions at achieved. So this was also reflected in anthropometric parameters 
and also in cardiovascular risk factors. These are not confidence interval. This is the whole distribution. There were no changes, however, no changes, no significant changes in LDL. All the other parameters were not only statistically significant in the comparison of changes between the intervention and control, but also clinically significant. So, and the good news is that the weight loss was maintained in the long term because the advantage of the Mediterranean diet, it is that it is highly palatable. So, and also in physical activity after one year, we saw a difference in the intervention versus control. And we are also um, checking this with objective measurements with accelerometers in uh, an important subset of participants. In the uh, supplement that we published in JAMA with a statistical analysis plan, we have planned to analyze cancer only after 10 years after randomization. So we need to be patient because the induction and the latent periods are important to be taken into account. So published studies on cancer in PREDIMED, this was the most important paper. It appeared online in 2014 and it was published in 2015 in, in printed version, and we saw a very important reduction in the risk of breast cancer, incident breast cancer. It was the, the first randomized trial with an overall dietary pattern showing a reduction for primary prevention of breast cancer with a Mediterranean diet plus extra virgin olive oil, 62% relative reduction. This is consistent with uh, many case control studies, and also some cohort studies conducted in Mediterranean countries, um, especially because of the extra virgin olive oil. We didn't see a significant association, although the, the trend was um, to uh, protection for the Mediterranean diet plus nuts. However, this was based in a very uh, low number of cases, despite we included more than 4,000 women in this randomized period with five years uh, randomized uh, trial with a period of four, almost five years of follow-up. And also we saw here that the higher the amount of calories coming from extra virgin olive oil, the lower the risk of breast cancer in a dose response significant trend. So when uh, the amount of olive oil achieved 15% of extra virgin olive oil, this is important, uh, achieved more than 15% of calories, there was a significant reduction in the risk. So uh, also this is confirmed by this, uh, you see in the title, type does matter. Virgin olive oil contains very interesting compounds for protecting against cancer, especially oleocanthal, which has an uh, anti-inflammatory effects demonstrated in many, many aspects. It is not present, this is interesting in the olives, it only appears in the production of extra virgin olive oil and the refined common olive oil is devoid of this. And oleacin, this is also um, a derivative of hydroxide tyrosol and it is a most powerful antioxidant. Another phenolic compounds present in extra virgin olive oil. Also in PREDIMED we saw with a, what we call pro-vegetarian dietary pattern. This was an original idea of the PREDIMED that was for omnivores, people who eat meat and all animal products, they are not vegan, a gentle approach to a more, uh, a diet with more vegetables and less animal foods. And we saw with this score that the, uh, the higher the adherence to this pro-vegetarian diet, the lower the risk of total mortality. Uh, this was the scoring criteria using quintiles uh, in a positive sense and in a reverse sense, uh, a positive for vegetable food groups and uh, an inverse trend, uh, reversing the quintiles for animal food groups. So uh, we have from, uh, from, from uh, five to, to 60 points. And for cancer deaths, the, we also saw this inverse trend, but it was not statistically significant. The main reason for mortality, however, in the PREDIMED was not cardiovascular disease, but cancer mortality. Also uh, with the dietary inflammatory index, we saw a reduction in uh, mortality in both in the SAN cohort and PREDIMED 
with the uh, anti-inflammatory diet. So we see here a higher mortality with the pro-inflammatory diet that was statistically significant and very similar in the two Spanish cohort analyzed in the same uh, way. So, and other studies on cancer, uh, we saw in the uh, nurses' health study uh, and health professional follow-up study for categories of olive oil intake, uh, a reduction in cancer mortality that was very important in these two cohorts, especially in the female cohort of the nurses' health study with olive oil, and this is consistent with the result in the PREDIMED. In the PREDIMED for um, total mortality, uh, the, the p-value for the olive oil group was 0 0.10, 0 0.11. So it was not statistically significant, but it exhibited in the point estimate the lowest mortality. Uh, and also uh, for cancer mortality, with, uh, we did a replacement study. So isocaloric replacement for every 10 grams of olive oil replaced, replacing margarine or substituting for butter. Uh, or other fats, uh, the point estimates were always in the protective direction. And also Andrea Romanos, uh, who was a former uh, doctoral candidate uh, in our department. Now she's at the Harvard School of Public Health. She's a postdoc there. And uh, she published together with Fran Hu and Estefania Toledo uh, this replication of the pro-vegetarian diet. Uh, for uh, breast cancer. So uh, combining the two nurses health uh, studies, the nurses health study one and two, and uh, she's Andrea Romanos, and uh, she found a protection by this pro-vegetarian uh, diet. Uh, and also when they split it uh, in healthful and unhealthful plant-based diet, because for example, sodas are plant-based, but they are not healthy and some commercial bakeries. So uh, only for the healthful plant-based dietary index, there was a protection very similar to the total plant-based diet. And very interestingly, uh, this protection was all especially apparent for estrogen receptor negative breast cancer with almost 2,000 cases of breast cancer with, who were negative for the estrogen receptors. Um, and review and highlights. So uh, this is important. Uh, there are uh, plenty of studies showing that red and processed meats uh, have a, an adverse effect on the risk of cancer here for red meats in this um, uh, meta-analysis very recent, uh, less than one year ago, uh, only of prospective cohort studies, uh, they found these uh, significant uh, associations with a higher risk, comparing the highest versus the lowest category with a random effects meta-analysis. And also for processed meats for some cancers, they found uh, a uh, harmful association, as you see in this slide. And also the reverse is found for fruit and vegetable uh, intake. This is the combination of the two Harvard cohorts conducted by uh, one of our postdocs, Don Wang. Uh, Five minutes, Miguel Angel, sorry for Okay, okay, I, I, I am finishing already. So uh, for cancer mortality, you see that the, the old advice of five a day Five, the, in the upper part, you see for fruits and vegetables. And in the lower part of the slide, this is the meta-analysis combining not only these two large American cohorts, but also 24 other prospective cohort studies with this accrual of deaths and person years, almost 2 million person years. You see that for cancer mortality, there is an L-shaped pattern uh, with uh, significant effects for three, four pieces of fruits a day. So a recommendation of three pieces of fruit per day was also protective against cancer according to this meta-analysis of observational prospective cohort studies. Olive oil is also important. These are my message, reduced re reductions in red meat and processed meats, increasing uh, fruits and vegetables, and also olive oil, especially uh, extra virgin olive oil. Uh, this is a graphic summary of our paper 
together with uh, Jose Lushinger, Francesco Vicioli, Frank Hu, and, uh, uh, and uh, um, Manuel Franco uh, and Walter Willett. And we uh, are conducting now uh, three uh, secondary prevention uh, trials, randomized trials. Predimer, Predimar is for the prevention of arrhythmia and relapses. And the, the intervention has been completed, the follow-up is completed, so we are close to have the results very soon. These are all patients, 720 participants who receive an ablation of atrial fibrillation. Predidep is also for preventing relapses of uh, depression conducted by Almudena Sanchez Villegas, um, who is also a professor of, of preventive medicine, and live breast, uh, where Marina is also involved, uh, coordinated by Estefania Toledo, that is to prevent relapses of breast cancer. And the recruitment is uh, now ongoing, continues ongoing in, in this moment. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miguel Angel. You have been on time, <laughs> more than on time. So Mark, the floor is yours. Firstly, thank you for this invitation. Um, it's a yeah, real pleasure to be able to um, present some of our work from the, the nutrition and metabolism branch here at IARC and also to maybe discuss potential collaborations between um, us and um, institutes in Spain. Um, so I thought just before I start presenting some of our work, I'd just give an overview of our, of our branch because I think it could be useful for, for you and um, some of the other um, listeners in the audience who might want to develop collaborations with us. So um, our branch is focused on identifying causal links between diet, lifestyle, obesity, and cancer. Um, we work in a very multidisciplinary way. So within the branch, we, um, we have, um, uh, we're coordinating cohorts. So you already mentioned EPIC, I'll be talking about that later, but also some studies in low to middle income countries, um, particularly in Africa and Latin America. Uh, we're conducting field work. So we are now conducting some intervention studies and setting up new population-based studies um, we are overseeing um, the, the IARC Biobank, which includes the, the EPIC bio repository, which in, contains millions of aliquots or, or blood samples. Um, we have expertise in databases and statistics within the branch, and also we have a lab, which um, is focused on metabolomics, so performing high-resolution mass spectrometry, um, but also um, more protein-based assays. Um, so collectively, we've got expertise in epidemiology, biostats, nutrition, um, biochemistry, mass spectrometry, and also um, growing um, expertise in, in genetics as well. Uh, we're about 53 staff members currently, and we're organized into six teams. So I'm the branch head, and then we have these six teams, which are led by my colleagues. So the hormones and metabolism team, which is led by Sabino Rinaldi. Um, lifestyle exposure interventions led by Inga Hubrex, biostatistics and data integration led by Pietro Ferrari and Vivian Bialon, a nutrition and cancer multimorbidity led by Heinz Friesling, Oncometabolomics, which is the metabolomics lab, plus um, an epidemiology component led by Mazda, which is um, Pekka Keskirakan and the Mazda Genab, and a metabolic epidemiology led by, by Neil Murphy. So, but we also work in a very integrative collective way. So most studies we're conducting within the branch um, tend to involve several of the teams. So what I'm going to talk about this morning, and I'll, I'll try to keep the time. Um, so I'm just going to give a very um, um, brief overview on what we understand around diet, lifestyle, and cancer, particularly highlighting some of the challenges in this field. Um, I'm then going to talk about cohort studies, and in particular, EPIC. Um, and I'm just going to show some, some new results we've got on ultra-processed foods and cancer. And I think some of the results from that will be very aligned with what some of the work that Miguel just, just presented. Um, I'm then going to talk about about metabolomics and the application of omics technologies to understand mechanisms linking um, diet and lifestyle with cancer. And I'll pick some examples from some of our recent work and then finish with some conclusions. So I, I think the, the, the notion that diet is contributing to cancer has been around for some time. So back in the early eighties, obviously Dolan Pito um, presented this seminal paper uh, where they tried to quantify the, the, the population attributable risks for various cancer risk factors. And they estimated at that time that around 20 to 50% of the, the PAF for cancer could be attributed to diet. Um, so that, that was somewhat controversial. And I, I, think, um, um, I think now um, we're kind of with the accumulation of data uh, we've got from various epidemiologic studies. Um, I don't think they were too far off. I think if you also include within that um, obesity, 
uh, and poor metabolic control. I, I think certainly um, around at least 20% of the cancer burden is attributable to, to, to diet obesity, and, and it may actually be, be higher than that. Um, these are some more um, uh, um, up-to-date um, um, preventability estimates for, for different lifestyle factors and cancer, which came from World Cancer Research Fund. Um, so looking at breast, endometrial, liver, and colorectal cancer, um, and then quantifying the, the preventability of these cancers um, if we were to, to reduce exposure to, to certain risk factors or increase exposure to certain risk factors in, in four different countries. Um, and what you can immediately see is there's some quite degree of variability between different cancers in terms of risk factors, but also between countries. So for example, if you look at um, breast cancer, you can see that for, for the US, UK, Brazil, and China, um, um, between 15 to 20% um, of breast cancer could be potentially prevented, postmenopausal breast cancer could be prevented if women to avoid um, being, being overweight or obese. Um, but if you look at alcoholic drinks, you can see there's quite a degree of variability. So in, in, in the UK, um, more than 20% of breast cancer cases could be, could be prevented if women were to reduce their alcohol intake, whereas it's much lower for, for China. Um, but this really reflects the, the prevalence of that exposure in these different countries. So obviously, um, consumption of alcohol is greater in some countries versus others. Um, but I, I think what's really important to note is that this, this is a um, landscape that's changing. We know that many countries of the world are, are now adopting more more Western lifestyle habits. We know that the prevalence of obesity and the consumption of Western diet is increasing in, in many parts of the world. So it's quite possible that um, if we were to um, redo this analysis in, in the coming years, the, the population of typical fractions for, for these different risk factors for, for the different cancers could, could be quite, quite variable. So for example, particularly in Brazil and China, I think we'd see an increase in, in the contribution of, of, of diet and of body fatness and alcohol um, for, for these cancers. So the World Cancer Research Fund, I mean, I would say that they're probably one of the, the world's authorities on um, combining and um, um, analyzing data on nutrition and diet and lifestyle and, and cancer. Um, and they then um, use that data to, to make recommendations around cancer prevention. Um, I like to show this slide because it, it really gives a very um, nice overview of what's known for different aspects of the diet and lifestyle in relation to different cancer endpoints. So um, what you can see here is that um, uh, if you look at uh, a dark green, it convincingly decreases risk of that particular cancer, whereas um, dark red it convincingly increases risk, and then the others are kind of more intermediate. So what you can immediately see is if you look at certain risk factors like body fatness, you can see it's an established convincing risk factor for a number of different cancers. So esophageal adenocarcinoma, stomach cancer, gallbladder, liver, um, colorectum. Um, um, but, uh, and then if you look, for example, at physical activity, um, you can see there's convincing evidence that it, it protects against colorectal cancer, um, and then um, possible protects against postmenopausal breast cancer and endometrial cancer. Um, but I think what's, what, what's also quite striking about this is that there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot of gaps. Um, and that's really primarily driven by um, um, lack of data from high quality studies. Um, the majority of the, the evidence that goes into these recommendations comes from prospective cohort studies. And most of this is coming from a very small um, number of countries from around the world. And I think this really highlights that we actually need more research um, using prospective cohort studies, but also using clinical trials, such as the one that Miguel just presented, um, not only in Western countries, but I think increasingly more in, in um, other, other parts of the world to try to really understand the link between these different dietary factors and, and cancer. Um, I think some, there's some important issues for studying nutrition and cancer. Um, so, I mean, we, we know that nutrition likely plays an important role in cancer development because it's so fundamental for maintaining healthy physiology. Um, and I think experimental studies have shown quite convincingly that if you change exposure to particular nutrients or aspects of the diet, it has effects on, on cancer hallmarks. Um, and there are animal studies showing that, for example, um, particular diets are, are likely to, to um, promote certain um, cancers. But I think for studying this in humans, we're, we're faced with a really um, complex set of challenges. So firstly, nutrition itself is inherently complex. So you don't tend to eat um, particular nutrients or, or dietary factors in, um, in isolation. You're eating um, a combination of different foods. Um, these then interact um, uh, with the human metabolome, with the microbiome. And so what you end up being exposed to um, at the biological level can be quite different depending on um, different individuals, different diets. So that, that, that's already one um, quite, quite complex factor we have to face. Um, 
when measuring nutrition in, in certainly in epidemiologic studies, we're faced with exposure assessment error. So um, we often rely on self-reported questionnaires. We know that people always don't always tell us the truth and they don't always remember well what they what they've been eating so that's always going to be a, a, a factor i mean there are ways to circumvent that but i think it's something we we have to face um confounding i think is a major issue for studies of diet cancer we know that there are other cancer risk factors which are correlated with with diet um obesity physical activity um social economic status um uh, inability to really um account for these in in our research i think is a major major issue. I mean, the, the clinical trials that Miguel presented, they they circumvent the confounding issue to, to a large degree. But um, I think when we're thinking about prospect, large prospective studies, it's, it's a major problem. Um, fourthly, mechanisms and causality. So I think this is a, a major challenge in diet and cancer. We see associations between certain aspects of the diet and, and cancer, but we don't always understand why, what's happening at the biological level. Um, and I think this is actually um, a kind of a hindrance to, to perform, to providing more robust um, evidence and recommendations around diet and cancers that we don't really understand what's happening um, in, in terms of causality. Um, so I think this is something uh, us as epidemiologists need to kind of grapple with more and maybe work more with, with experimental research groups to try to validate our findings. And also just to point out, that I think for nutrition and cancer, we're really dealing with weak to moderate effects. Okay, so it's not like this, the, the relative risks we see for, for smoking and lung cancer. Uh, we tend to be dealing with relative risks in the order of 1.1, even up to two, maybe. It would be a very um, um, high relative risk for some of the, the, um, the links between nutrition and lifestyle and cancer. But, but because um, the, wide, the large prevalence of, of say, um, certain diets and obesity, the, actual, um, the, the population with tributal burden is actually quite substantial, even though the relative risks themselves might be quite, quite modest. But the, the, the problem with these, effects is that the, the, the impact of confounding a measurement error has a greater impact on whether we can actually detect um, um, significant um, uh, effects of, of, of diet. Um, and a question I think we're, we're particularly interested in is can we, under, can we use biomarkers and, and omics technologies to help with some of this? Um, can we use some of these technologies to help better quantify the diet, quantify the biological response to particular diets, and also help us understand mechanisms and causality? So I'm going to present some of our, our work around that um, um, today. Um, as I said, we're, we're particularly focused on population-based cohorts. I mean, I think these are very valuable, um, um, uh, recruiting thousands of individuals with, for example, pre-diagnostic blood samples and detailed epidemiologic data. And these can be then followed over decades, over which time um, certain people develop cancers and other disease endpoints. And then um, in that respect, we can then look back in time and say, what was it about their diet or their characteristics, which might be associated with them developing that? Um, that, that particular cancer. Um, we know that it doesn't necessarily um, infer causality um, because these are still observational studies, um, but I think they can be useful to, to um, um, identify potential risk factors, which can then be followed up, for example, experimentally or in using clinical trials. Um, so the various um, large prospective cohorts now around the world, I mean, um, um, here at IARC, we were a coordinator of the European Perspective Association to Cancel EPIC, um, of which there were five centres in Spain contributing to this. Um, but there are other cohorts we're also working with, for example, UK Biobank. Um, we're now working with, um, for example, co cohorts in Spain like the City App database, which is actually a really useful um, resource. Um, we're also working quite extensively within the NCI cohort consortium, so um, a large consortia bringing cohorts together to, to increase sample size. Um, and I think having pre-diagnostic bloods really opens opportunities for, for um, applying cutting edge omics technologies within the context of these prospective cohorts. So for example, um, we can measure diet and lifestyle among the participants. And then within the blood, we can um, uh, look at the metabolome, proteome, um, and increasingly other, other aspects of, of, of kind of metabolism, the microbiome, um, and then identify potential biomarkers for, for these dietary exposures and intermediates, which can then help us understand understand mechanism. So just to quickly introduce EPIC, because sort of, I'm not sure if everyone's aware. Um, so um, this is a cohort of more than 500,000 participants recruited in the, the early to mid to mid 90s um, across 23 centres in 10 European countries. So this is ranging from Scandinavian countries, UK, Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, um, France, and then the Mediterranean countries, so Spain, Italy, and Greece. Um, and the rationale for that was really to try to capture variation in diet across Europe 
back in the 1990s. Um, I think that the, the landscape's changed a bit now. Um, I think um, in, in some ways the diets across you have become a bit more um, homogenous. Um, I, I read an article recently saying that the, the Mediterranean diet is actually more prevalent in Scandinavian countries now than it is in Spain or, or in Greece, which is um, an interesting phenomenon. Um, but I think certainly when EPIC was set up, um, that was um, part of the rationale to capture this variation in diet. And um, uh, extensive data was collected on, um, on diet, lifestyle, um, and importantly, um, blood samples were collected from, from around 350,000 EPIC participants, um, which then offers the opportunities now to, to perform biomarker-based studies. Um, so um, as of around 20, 2018, this was the number of um, incident um, um, cancer cases in EPIC. So um, more than 62,000 members of the cohort had developed a cancer. Um, after the baseline um, um, recruitment, um, there were around 58,000 deaths. Um, so this op offers, um, opens up substantial opportunities to, for studying um, the, um, risk factors for these different cancers and also for, for mortality. Um, just to point out that also in EPIC, there are other um, um, diseases of, of particular interest. So for example, diabetes, the EPIC Interact um, 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 case cohort study, EPIC CAR, EPIC CBD, um, and then studies on weight gain and Parkinson's disease, um, neurogenetic disorders, and also IBD and Crohn's disease. Um, we're actually embarking upon a new round of follow-up for the EPIC cohort in the next year. So um, given the aging structure of the cohort, um, it's quite likely the number of incident cancers will would increase quite substantially. And we've estimated it's probably going to be reaching more around 100,000, maybe possibly more um, incident cancers once we complete this new round of follow-up across the cohort. Um, and then just, just, just to point out, these are some of the breakdowns of the different cancer cases. So breast cancer by far is the most common cancer in EPIC. Around two thirds of EPIC are actually women. Um, so there's a disproportionate number of um, um, breast cancers, but you can see um, even for cancers like colorectal and prostate cancer, there's more than 7,000 incident cases. Um, so this offers op opportunities for, in, in several ways. Firstly, with um, the large number of cases, we can actually look at some of the less common cancers, for which we have really very little data in, um, information on risk factors, particularly diet and lifestyle. So for example, liver, ovary, kidney, pancreatic cancer. But then even for the more common cancers, we can actually perform quite um, um, more detailed, for example, subsite analyses and um, maybe integrate kind of molecular information from the tumors, which we know is increasingly important for um, understanding etiology and also for, for prognosis. So, um, I mean, EPIC has produced a, a, a quite a, um, a wide um, battery of um, um, publications over the last um, 15 years, um, linking different aspects of the diet to cancer. Um, I think the phase we're in now is really trying to make better use of the cohort and the data um, and thinking differently about the diet and are there novel dietary exposures that we can focus on within EPIC to try, try to help us understand the link between nutrition and, and cancer. So just one example I wanna show here is around ultra processed food. So I think, as I said, there's been this kind of westernization of, of diet um, which is characterized by a um, high intake of ultra processed foods. Um, and I think there's a growing interest in whether these particular um, parts of the diet could, could be playing a role in different chronic diseases, including cancer. Um, and I think there's, there's some substantial biological rationale behind that. So firstly, we know that ultra processed foods are very obesogenic um, and offer generally offer lower nutritional value. So uh, diets, people who are consuming higher levels of these, these sorts of diets tend to be more overweight. Um, but there are also, um, which we know is a risk factor for cancer in itself, um, but there are also other aspects to these ultra processed foods which might be relevant for, for, for tumor genesis. So for example, we know that there are certain contaminants within ultra processed foods um, which have shown to have carcinogenic properties in experimental models, um, for example, dietary advanced glycation end products were of interest, um, but also food add additives. Um, are there compounds within these types of foods which could be, could be promoting cancer? Um, to date, there's very limited evidence for an association between um, degree of food processing, both lower degrees and higher degrees of food processing and cancer risk. There was a study from um, the Nutrinet Santé cohort in France, which provided some quite interesting um, data regarding breast cancer, but currently to date, there's very little other data from prospective cohorts. So um, my colleague Inga Hubrex, um, she's really um, spearheaded this, this work within EPIC to to firstly classify the, um, the EPIC data according to this NOVA classification, which was developed by Carlos Montero in, in Brazil, um, which is a way of processing, um, classifying foods in terms of their degree of processing. So we see these four different groups. So those in group one are unprocessed or minimally processed foods. So for example, um, legumes, fruits, vegetables, um, and eggs. 
um, certain types of meat even. Um, group two, which are processed culinary ingredients, including, for example, oil, um, sugar, salt. Processed foods in group three, um, which might include some, for example, cheeses. And then ultra processed foods, which are things like um, sodas, cakes, um, 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 white bread, and these sorts of foods. So just, just to kind of say, this isn't a perfect way of classifying these foods. I think there are some um, caveats with it, but certainly I think it's a very useful guide for, for looking at a degree of um, um, processing and whether that could be relevant for, um, um, for chronic diseases. So just to show some, 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 some results from, from this analysis in EPIC. So we actually looked at the degree of food processing and um, um, around 13 different cancers. So primarily, primarily those cancers which have been linked to um, um, lifestyle um, obesity. Um, and we wanted to look to see the, the, um, the association between the degree of food processing and then these different cancers. And I've just highlighted here the cancers for which we saw significant associations. So for example, head and neck, um, esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, hepatocellulitis carcinoma, and postmenopausal breast cancer. Um, and this, these results are for the four different food groups. So per, um, um, well, the hazard ratio per, per um, one standard deviation increment. Um, so what, what's, what really strikes you first of all is that um, the um, people who are consuming more unprocessed foods had a lower risk of these cancers. And this was in a multivariate model, which included other cancer risk factors, including BMI. Um, so you can see, um, for example, for um, um, head and neck cancer, there was this um, um, 0.76 reduction, um, uh, the hazard ratio of 0.76 um, association between um, um, those consuming high levels of uh, unprocessed foods and, and um, risk of head and neck cancer. Whereas if you look at Nova Group 4, so these are the ultra processed foods, they had a significant increased risk of, of head and neck cancer. And that, that um, was maintained even um, when you control for, for example, smoking and, and alcohol. Um, what was also interesting is though, the, the positive associations would tend to be Nova Group 3. So those people who are consuming more, more processed foods, not necessarily ultra processed foods, they seem to have a, um, a higher risk of these, of these different cancers. Whereas those in Nova Group 2, so these are kind of culinary, um, so in um, oils and salts, there was, no, there was no increased risk. And in fact, there was trends towards a kind of inverse direction. Um, so kind of the, the takeaway message from this is that diets which are more un, richer in unprocessed foods that are potentially more protective um, against some of these cancers, whereas those di the diets which are more rich in processed foods tend to have a um, higher risk of developing these, these cancers. So I think some of these results are actually quite consistent with what Miguel was showing, for example, um, consumption of um, Mediterranean-based diet, diets which are richer in um, fruits and vegetables and, um, and um, unprocessed foods and, and oils and olive oil um, tend to potentially be protective against certain cancers. Um, and this is just another way of showing the results in, in, in quartiles. So you can see there's this quite nice dose response relationship, for example, for Nova Group 1, um, particularly for, for head and neck cancer, um, colorectal cancer. You can see there's this um, very nice inverse association between greater consumption of unprocessed foods and, and cancer, as we see the opposite for, um, for the, more, the more processed foods. Um, just to quickly move on to uh, metabolism. So I'm sure many of you remember this um, from um, uh, university or medical school. Um, so we are very much interested in metabolism and the interaction between diet um, and um, the, the microbiome, for example, and how these interact um, in, in altering the, the metabolome and then that's in, and, and its impact on, on, on cancer. Um, and I think the application of metabolomics could be actually really um, 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 very useful for understanding not only exposures, but also the degree to which these exposures impact then upon, upon cancer risk. Um, so, for example, um, when you consume certain foods, you're exposed to things in the environment. We then have this kind of metabolic processing and this um, internal exposome, which we can then measure using um, high resolution mass spectrometry, for example, and then relate that to, to cancer risk. And there is a growing number of studies from different cohorts around the world which are doing this quite successfully. So I'm going to show some examples of that from, from EPIC. Um, and I think this kind of profiling could be useful in different ways. So firstly, it could potentially identify novel risk factors, refine a high risk phenotype, um, so, for example, we're doing some work with obesity, which I'm going to show in a second, where we can identify particular metabolic phenotypes within obesity, which might be more relevant for cancer risk rather than just relying on anthropometry. Um, we also um, can be useful for identifying novel biomarkers of exposures, for example, dietary factors and metabolism, identifying sets of predictive biomarkers, um, and also then 
then think about mechanism and identify molecular targets and pathways for, for interventions. Um, within EPIC, we've been building up this um, platform where we've been integrating metabolomics data, both targeted and targeted, which we're measuring here at IARC, um, other biomarker data, for example, other cancer risk factors, so insulin, inflammation, um, um, proteomics, and then also integrating that with genomic data across the cohort so we can have this kind of integrated platform where we have both me metabolism um, and um, um, lifestyle factors as well as genetics and try to bring these together to try to understand um, no novel causal pathways for, for cancer. Just to show an example um, of, I think, um, kind of the interesting results that metabolomics can generate. So this is results from EPIC for breast and endometrial cancer. And I purposely put these side by side because these are two female cancers which have um, common risk factors. So for example, obesity, um, exposure to un un unopposed estrogens, um, various reproductive factors. But the, the, the metabolites associated with these cancers are actually quite different. So um, this, this is work led by um, my colleagues, Mathilde Is and Sabina Rinaldi, where they looked at um, uh, the, the breast cancer metabolome. So identifying um, metabolites associated with breast cancer. And what you can see um, is the odds ratios per standard deviation for the metabolite um, versus a p-value. We see a cluster of metabolites which were inversely associated with breast cancer um, in EPIC. Um, and notably the, the um, amino acid arginine, which I think is of interest. I mean, there's been a lot of um, studies showing that arginine and supplementation uh, might be beneficial for, for survive, breast cancer survival. But this is the first time it's been shown that circulating levels of arginine are, are potentially um, inversely associated with developing breast cancer. So um, these are quite, quite um, in, interesting results. Um, on the other hand, we found one metabolite which was very strongly positively associated with breast cancer, and this was a C2-acyl carnitine, which is a um, compound involved in um, endogenous metabolism, particularly energy metabolism, and has been linked to, to diabetes and, and obesity. If you look on the right-hand panel, this is for endometrial cancer, so again, a, a cancer which is very strongly linked to obesity, but you can see a very um, different pattern of metabolites associated with endometrial cancer. So um, we see um, a set of metabolites, mainly branched-chain amino acids, um, which show a positive association with endometrial cancer development, so isoleucine, valine, um, and then a set of metabolites which are inversely associated, so for example, glyce amino acid glycine, um, which again has been linked to um, better metabolic control um, and diabetes. So um, I think these, these kind of results can um, potentially show that there might be, um, even though we have cancers with very similar risk factors, um, probing the metabolism more deeply could identify novel pathways which might which might be associated with the development of, of, of these tumours. And um, what we're doing now is trying to think about what are the correlates of these me metabolites? Can we work with experimental research groups to understand how they might be relevant for, for cancer development, both um, mechanistically? Just a, quick, a couple of quick examples of um, application of metabolomics for understanding cancer risk factors and then um, um, their relationship with, with, um, with cancer endpoints. So we're particularly invest in, interested in obesity and cancer. So trying to understand the link between obesity and cancer at the mechanistic level. Um, this is some work that we did looking at the obesity metabolome in um, around 4,500. Five minutes, Mark, sorry. Yeah. Um, and 4,500 EPIC participants. Um, what you can see is, a, um, and not surprisingly, a very large number of metabolites are, seem to be um, dysregulated in obesity. Um, so again, some of the branched amino acids, which I just showed you for endometrial cancer, so valine, um, um, leucine, isoleucine, um, and then some metabolites which are downregulated in obesity, so various um, fatty acids, lipids, again, glycine, um, uh, and, and other biogenic compounds. Um, so this is, um, I think to date, it's the largest study which has looked at the kind of obesity um, metabolome and trying to characterize are there particular met metabolic perturbations which could be um, of, in of interest. What we wanted to do is then to take these, these this, this, this um, results and then apply it to, to cancer. Um, so what we did was we identified an obesity um, metabolite signature. So can we um, identify a set of metabolites which are associated with, these, with, with obesity? and then relate that to, to two obesity-related cancers, so colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer. Um, so this is work, work led by um, one of our postdocs, Natalie Kleeman. Um, and what it showed was that if you um, create this obesity metabolite signature, um, it was predictive of both colorectal and endometrial cancer. And interestingly, for endometrial cancer, even after you control for, for the kind of um, anthropometric obesity, we still see a significant association between the metabolic signature um, and endometrial cancer development, suggesting that the metabolomics is really helping us pick up um, 
um, risk factors or um, potentially causal pathways which could be associated with endometrial cancer beyond just relying on, on anthropometry. So um, we're kind of um, working on this further to try to better understand the role of these different uh, metabolites in, in the obesity cancer link, for example, using mediation analysis. But I think it shows very nicely that um, this kind of work can actually tell us more than just relying on, on questionnaire based or um, anthropometric measurements. Um, we've been using metabolomics to identify novel um, biomarkers for, for diet. So this is what work that led by um, um, colleagues, but I was within um, uh, within my, my branch um, and other um, and colleagues over the years. So we identifying, for example, polyphenols and other aspects of the diet, which were associated with, um, which, um, which could potentially be um, good dietary biomarkers. Um, just to give a few examples of where we've been applying this to try to get better understanding of links between nutrition and cancer. So I wanted to highlight the work we've been doing on meat and colorectal cancer. So obviously, um, meat, um, red and processed meat is a risk factor for, for cancer. Is, um, um, I think fairly well established, particularly for colorectal cancer. It's being ranked as a, um, um, a carcinogen by the IARC monographs now. Um, and I think it's a, there's quite a lot of consistent evidence from um, many different studies, prospective cohort studies from around the world, linking processed and red meat to colorectal cancer. Um, but we know this is um, um, quite controversial. Um, a, a couple of years ago, um, a set of um, review papers came out, which were basically um, uh, reducing the, um, the, um, uh, the, um, the, the, the impact of observational studies um, on, on linking red meat with cancer and suggesting that only randomized clinical trials could be could offer the, the kind of highest level of evidence for linking um, red meat and cancer. And as such, it created some controversy because um, just relying on um, just relying on very few um, RCTs out there, of course, there's not going to be a huge amount of data. I mean, this was a very controversial moment, I think, for, for the field. Um, because it basically downgraded, uh, uh, attempted to downgrade the, the potential role of, of red and processed meat in, in cancer. Um, and this, this was, um, came up in the press a lot um, and caused a lot of um, kind of, um, yeah, as I say, controversy in the field. And as I said before, I think one of the, the challenges is that we don't really have good causal understanding by which red and processed meat might be um, link, uh, might be increasing risk of um, um, colorectal cancer. And I think that's what's really needed here to, to go alongside the observational evidence and try and get that evidence and offer a more kind of robust framework or, for, for, um, for red and processed meat being risk factor for colorectal cancer. So, so very quickly, I just want to show some results from one of our PhD students, Roland Bidikind, um, to identify novel biomarkers of, of processed meat. And he conducted a dietary intervention study uh, where we recruited 12 healthy adults so using a um, randomized crossover design um, feeding them different types of, of processed meat. Um, so hot dogs, bacon, salami, um, non-processed meat as in pork, and then tofu as a control. Um, um, collected blood samples um, after um, each five, um, three day food period. Um, and then um, applied untargeted um, high resolution mass spectrometry to, to these samples. Um, and he found there were certain compounds which distinguished um, the different types of meat. So for example, for methyl syringyl sulfate, um, was much more um, um, uh, levels of this were much more high, higher among those who were um, consuming hot dogs, um, and then piperine, um, which was again a compound which was um, much um, 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 strongly related to um, con um, consumption of salami. So I think this work showed that um, these different types of processed meat they 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 do have their own biochemical characteristics, um, and can that then the question is can that help us understand the link between those and and, and cancer development. Um, he uh, managed to validate his findings from the intervention studies within, within the EPIC cross-sectional study, uh, where again, he showed that people reported consuming high levels of certain types of processed meat also have had high levels of certain compounds, for example, those consuming um, um, these kind of processed meats, so um, um, salami and um, certain sausages had high levels of um, these four methyl syringyl sulfates. So after identifying these novel biomarkers for processed meat, we then applied them to um, um, a study looking at colorectal cancer risk with an EPIC using the, um, the blood samples, um, the pre-diagnostic blood samples. So these are just some very preliminary results, but what we found was that certain compounds were significantly associated with, with colorectal cancer, but this tended to differ by, by subsite. So there is this growing recognition that um, different um, parts of the, the gastrointestinal tract, and particularly the, the colorectum, um, have their own distinct risk factors, which might reflect biology, the influence of the gut microbiota, 
Um, but I think this is quite intriguing because it shows that certain compounds were associated with distal colon, for example, hydroxyproline, um, whereas, for example, piperine and piperitine were only associated with, with proximal colon cancer. So um, I think this, again, um, is quite quite interesting because it, it shows that um, uh, these sorts of kind of um, probing more deeply into the metabolites and the kind of biochemistry of these foods uh, might help uncover um, potential mechanisms linking um, consumption of these um, compounds and, and, and cancer. Um, I know I'm running out of time, but very quickly, just to show that we've also been doing some work on alcohol, um, work led by my colleague Preto Ferrari and uh, Master Genab looking at um, alcohol um, um, and identify novel biomarkers of alcohol um, using data from EPIC and also the ATBC cohort in the US, um, where they identified two compounds which were um, significantly associated with um, alcohol drinking, so 2-hydroxy-3-methylbutyric acid, um, and then one compound which currently we've not been able to identify using our um, um, kind of chemometric analysis. Um, but what it does show is it, it does very well classify um, those drinking versus those who are not drinking. So it could potentially be a good biomarker of alcohol, alcohol consumption. And what's really interesting is that it seems to be um, very strongly predictive of certain cancers. So for example, 2 hydroxy 3 methylbutyric acid was very strongly associated with um, um, hepatocellular carcinoma in EPIC um, um, and also in um, ATBC. So we, we validated the results in, in two cohorts. Um, and what's interesting is that this these, these associations were much stronger than what we would see just by just relying on self-reported intake from the questionnaires. So for example, with HCC, um, certainly within this data set, there wasn't a strong association between alcohol consumption and, and HCC, but there was a very strong association for this, for this particular biomarker. Um, so again, this suggests that these sorts of approaches by applying metabolomics um, can potentially identify um, compounds which um, are associated with a particular dietary exposure, but might have a stronger link with with cancer because they might reflect endogenous metabolism and kind of maybe the kind of biologically um, affected dose. And then lastly, we're also doing some work to, to look at certain um, um, dietary patterns, um, looking at metabolic signatures of dietary patterns in relation to cancer risks. So this is some work we've done using the WSRF score um, for, for cancer prevention. Um, and what we did, so this, this score um, uh, is, is a potentially inversely associated, for example, with colorectal cancer. So people who are more adherent to this score, where they may maintain kind of the, the lifestyle recommendations for cancer prevention, they have a lower risk of colorectal cancer. But we also identified a metabolic signature for this score um, among um, more than 5,700 EPIC individuals, um, comprising 34 fatty acids and 146 metabolites in blood. Um, and then we, we broke this down and ended up with a score which had about seven metabolites, which was highly predictive of, of, of the score. And what's interesting is that this score, again, um, was much more strongly associated with colorectal cancer compared to the, the score derived solely from the, the, the questionnaire-based data, um, again, suggesting that by these sorts of metabolomic approaches can help us pick up um, um, additional um, aspects of metabolism on the diet, which might be associated with, with, with cancer development. So very quickly, so um, in, in summary, I mean, I think large scale, carefully conducted prospective studies of nutrition and cancer have yielded results that support laboratory data and to some extent intervention findings. Um, I think we're increasingly reliant on pooling data from different cohorts to, to um, come up with more precise risk estimates and also to perform important stratifications. Um, so I think this is an area that we're, we're certainly working on um, in the coming years. But just to highlight, I mean, I think there's really a, a need for future work, particularly around um, instrumentation, so measurement of the diet to come up with a more precise um, uh, measurements of, of diet and, and lifestyle, incorporating biomarkers and temporality. So often we rely on just one, um, one measurement at baseline. Um, in EPIC, we have been collecting data over follow-up on diet and lifestyle, and we're actually in the process of combining that data now here at IARC to look at changes in diet and lifestyle um, over the follow-up period and how that relates to cancer. Um, kind of using more integrated nutrition, um, other aspects of diet, food processing, additives, um, food biodiversity is an area that we are now, now working on. Um, integrating genomic data, so using, for example, GBIE analyses in some of these large um, consortia. Um, also using Mendel anonymization as a potential tool to, to help us um, infer causality. Um, but just to also point out that 
working in other countries and other parts of the world as well. So not just relying on, on Europe, um, but also thinking about low to middle income countries where, again, as I, as I said earlier, um, there is this trend towards a kind of westernization and um, there are also particularly unique exposures within those countries, which might tell us something about the relationship between diet, nutrition and cancer. Um, and I shall leave it there. And this is my email in case people would like to contact me with any aspects of what I've presented. And sorry, I overran a little bit. Thank you very much, Mark. You ran out of time, but I didn't want to interrupt you because the, the topic is really interesting. So now we have uh, around 70 people listening to, to you. Um, it's time for, for the question. So if you have any question, please um, ask, ask it. Uh, I don't know if you want to, to read the questions, Pilar, or whatever. Uh yeah, I will just uh, read the questions from the chat and, and you can follow up with them. There is a, for now, there is a comment from uh, somebody in Turkey. Uh, they say they are planning a case control study for gastric cancer, gastric cancer, which is actually the second most common in this region in Turkey, Erzurum in Turkey. Um, well, he's uh, given some uh, directions of the study they're, they're planning to do. So I will recommend him to, to, to write to this email of, of Mark because he's saying that Epic World will be a guide for them. Uh, so I will recommend yeah, cool. him to, to write directly to, to Mark or, or Miguel Angel. Happy to help. So Marina, if you want to ask, ask them directly. Yes, I well, I have several questions. But just to start, uh, Mar, you, you commented about the obesity and diet, and sometimes we have this dilemma. Well, I think that is very nice. Your presentations really combine each other and also send the message that to prevent the most important uh, diseases in terms of mortality here in Spain, and it's the same in other, country, in other countries in Europe, at least, uh, we, we can have a common message because risk factors, and diet is one of the main ones, uh, the, the, the association may be stronger for one disease and, and weaker for other, but the message is the same. So in terms of diet, uh, I know that in the, in the estimations of um, Richard Dole and Richard Pito, they included obesity, uh, um, exercise, uh, well, um, and diet in, in their estimation, and we usually discuss that the uh, first message that we have to send is please uh, eat less, um, uh, but the Mediterranean diet and the studies focus on particular foods, the message is eat well. So I want to know your reflections regarding to this message. What, is, what comes first? Uh, uh, if we, ideally, we have to combine both, but... Uh, do, for example, does obesity has a weaker effect in people who, who eat better than other people in, in, in terms, for example, with the Mediterranean diet or other? So I don't know, start whatever you want to start. You, I, can, I can go first. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question and it's something we have been, been thinking about. So um, because obesity is such a strong risk factor for for, for, for up to 13 or maybe more more cancers now um i think um does it does it then matter what else you eat so if you if you if you avoid becoming obese um is it in, um is it relevant um, the other aspects of your diet i mean i would say it, it, it probably is i mean based on our some of our findings i mean we've done some analyses now where we've um we usually stratify by obesity um and we we tend to see that um i mean certainly for the ultra processed food work um, we, that, I, that was a particular concern of mine that, um, we might just be picking up the kind of obesity and obesogenic effects of people who are consuming these kind of high, highly processed versus unprocessed diets. But the results tend to be consistent, even if once you stratify by BMI. So among lean people, those who are consuming, um, higher amounts of processed foods had a higher risk of those cancers. Um, for those who are overweight and consuming, um, uh, more unprocessed foods, the, the result, the associations were a bit weaker actually. Um, so um, uh, I think um, it, it would seem that, I mean, certainly obesity is a, is a very important overriding factor um, for, 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 uh, for cancer. I think it does matter what else you're, you're eating. Um, I mean, these, these things are difficult to study because it's, they're all correlated. Often people who are consuming 
kind of healthier diets, they tend to be leaner. Um, and it's people who have unhealthier diets, which are richer in kind of processed foods, um, they, they tend to be more, more overweight. So sometimes in observational studies, it can be difficult to disentangle that. I mean, within EPIC, we're fortunate that it's a very large cohort and we can perform stratifications. But even with such a large cohort, we, we start running into um, sample size issues once you start breaking it down by obesity and particularly for some of the cancers, which are not necessarily very common. Um, so I think tackling those sorts of questions will require kind of pooled effort. I know that um, the Harvard pooling project they're very much interested in doing these sorts of analyses where you kind of stratify by, by obesity, but also, for example, socioeconomic status um, um, to try to, yeah, kind of remove that, that confounding effect. But, um, I don't know what Miguel thinks, but... Um. Yeah. I, I agree that uh, with, uh, with what you have said, uh, Mark, and also with the messages by, by Marina, that we need to repeat it less, it well, uh, there is a concept in the Spanish population, and I think that the same is, is the case in Italy and Greece, that because we are close to the Mediterranean Sea, we follow the Mediterranean diet. This is not true. When you do in a representative sample, as Fernando Rodriguez Artalejo and his team in the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, they did a representative sample and they applied the 14 item score of the Mediterranean diet that we developed in PREDIMED. The average of the Spanish population was 6.3 out of 14. So it is a failure in Spain. So I agree with what you have said that Perhaps people in Sweden nowadays follow better the Mediterranean diet than people who are in Mediterranean countries. So when we say Mediterranean diet, we are referring to the diet followed in the 60s and the 50s of the last century, especially in Crete and, and Southern European countries, not nowadays. And also, I think that the message should be uh, minimally processed foods or not in processed foods at all. This is a very important part of the message. And regarding the interaction between obesity, especially abdominal obesity, and a high quality dietary pattern, uh, I, I was the advisor for a doctoral thesis of Sonia Eguaras. Uh, she published three papers on this issue. And we did find in the, in the SAN cohort an interaction. The interaction was between higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet and attenuation of the adverse effects of uh, obesity on uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease and total mortality. So there is a, a, a seemingly a sort of interaction that a, a high quality dietary pattern may attenuate the adverse effects, especially on abdominal obesity, of the of uh, uh, high quantity of calories, and this is an important issue for PREDIMED Plus. This was when we designed the, the PREDIMED Plus study. We were thinking whether the, there is a synergism between high quality dietary pattern with a, a reduction of ultra processed foods and a reduction also in calories together with physical activity, and this can be a very powerful approach. And a, and a strong message. Another thing is the, the, the traditional messages that we are giving for 30 years now or 40 years. People uh, tend to think that these people working in nutrition every day says a different thing. <laughs> so you are changing the message. We do not change the message. For 40 years time, we were repeating eat five times a day, five servings a day of fruits and vegetables. And this is very powerful. We have once and again the same evidence and reduce the amount of red and processed meats and ultra processed foods. There is some movement by the food industry, by some sectors of the food industry to try to, to confuse the people and to say, well, uh, this classification, this novel classification is not uh, the best possible classification and they do not provide any better alternative. And these studies are not um, sensible or they are not accurate and you could not trust this. But we found in the San cohort, in the, in the cohort of uh, Enrica in, in, in uh, Madrid, 
in the Nutrinet Sante and in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey at the same time, almost at the same time, the same results regarding total mortality and increase in total mortality and cancer mortality associated with a higher consumption of ultra processed foods. So the, the, the evidence regard, uh, regardless of the potential for misclassification that you always find in, in every epidemiological study, uh, it is strong now to say that the same message. I very much agree with your message, Mark. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what you say about Spain and the Mediterranean diet. So um, before before this morning, I took a look at the EPIC data because we now have um, changes in lifestyle and diet across the EPIC countries. Um, actually, the Spanish um, have become un less healthy uh, mm -hmm. since the 1990s. We it's quite that. striking. Um, and um, the Scandinavian countries have become healthier so maybe they um, they've adopted a more Mediterranean um, diet. But um, I think one thing interesting for Spain as well is that um, I think Spain now has the highest rate of colorectal cancer in Europe, or well, certainly it's in the top three. Um, there's a cluster, um, a cluster of countries in Eastern Europe, um, Hungary and I think Slovakia have the highest rates of colorectal cancer, but now Spain is third. Um, and it's I wonder why that is. I mean, um, uh, interesting to see what you think, Miguel. I mean, do you think it has been maybe the, the the abandonment of the traditional diet and then, I mean, ob obesity as well, I mean, I think has increased quite a lot in, in Spain in the, the last decades, but it's interesting that we have such high rates now of colorectal cancer. The, 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 the rates of obesity in, in younger sectors of the population were uh, growing a lot in the in the last uh, two decades especially among younger people on the departure from the Mediterranean diet we have seen in all of us of studies yeah. all of our studies we have seen that the younger the people the the farther they are from the Mediterranean diet and yeah. this is a consequence of the globalization and the western diet that has been imported the American diet to Spain so uh, and this is a, a, a severe problem in, in Spain uh, you go to the supermarkets in Spain and you find mainly ultra processed foods. Mm. So they are very convenient. They're highly palatable. They are cheap. So they have a long uh, shelf life. Yes. So all these are advantages mm. for the food industry. And I think that the nutri score and all these things are not going to solve the problem. Uh, mm. you, we need to be more radical in public health and to, to give a strong messages regarding the harms of ultra processed foods that are highly consumed by the younger sectors of the Spanish population. Yeah. Okay, we have three <laughs> questions from the audience. So you I go will ahead, Marina, ask yeah. you to, to make your answers, answers sorted so to give them the opportunity to ask uh, the question. So Pilar, if you want to, to read, sure. thank you very much. So they congratulate you for the talks. And I think this question is for Mark, but maybe both of you can, can have an opinion. Do you think that one biological sample is enough to capture habitual diet? Uh... Yeah, it's a very good question. And I, I know by all. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I mean, I think it's been shown um, certainly for, for some aspects of the diet. Um, one sample, um, uh, one biological sample um, is, is likely um, good enough. I mean, there have been some studies, I think, from some of the Harvard cohorts um, and a study in the UK um, with blood samples collected um, I think a couple of years apart, um, which looked at um, certain metabolites and aspects of, of the diet and those blood samples and the correlations were, were pretty good. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think once you start getting further out, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, I, I, I don't know. Um, I think that could be more, more challenging. But um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, ideally in cohorts, we'd have multiple blood samples collected every few years. Um, but I mean, that's not feasible. Um, so um, I think uh, the UK Biobank is actually very useful because it has a blood sample, a second blood sample collected in around 8% of the participants a couple of years after the baseline blood. And that's often been used to correct um, the kind of misclassification in for certain biomarkers. Um, but on the whole, the, 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 the ICCs that you kind of see um, tend, tend to be pretty good. Um, so um, yeah, I would say, a quick answer is probably probably yes, um, but um, probably it depends upon the, the time frame. Okay, so I think this, this question can go for both of you. And it's interested in somebody wants to lose weight or something is what type of regular fasting would you recommend early dinner or maybe skipping breakfast? What do you think, Miguel? 
Well, <laughs> I think that the the available evidence is not definitive at this at this point. We don't have large trials, uh, run, large randomized trials showing that one is better than the other. Probably there is uh, some, um, some uh, aspect that needs to be personalized, not only regarding uh, the genetic background or the metabolomic background, but also the uh, psychological aspects of the person. I think that this can be more personalized regarding uh, how how uh, the the psychological aspects of the person uh, are suited for one alternative or, or the other. In, in some of these uh, large studies, the at the end of the day, the important thing was not the timing, but mm -hmm. the amount of calories that they that they reduced. Mm -hmm. So intermittent fasting or as on, or other or other. Um, methods for weight loss were uh, effective uh, in so far they reduce the total amount of calories uh, the total amount of food ingested so somebody from my in al nahas is asking you miguel angel uh, so uh, what kind of challenges did you face when setting up the interventional studies you talk about in your presentation can we know more about the intervention what kind of nutritional intervention did you implement well, in PREDIMED one, uh, the the main challenges were regarding the consumption of legumes, uh, and uh, but at the end of the day, we succeeded, and also uh, to obtain a, a, a high degree of contrast between the intervention and the control group. The the means that we used were face-to-face uh, -face interviews with the dietitians, uh, personal interviews every three months in PREDIMED one and also a group session with less than 20 participants every three months. In these sessions and in these interviews, there was a, a goal setting by negotiation between the dietitian and the participant. And we adopted the approach of what, what is easier for you to improve these 14 items. You have now seven points. How can you get eight or nine points in, in, in three months time for changing the, the way of preparing the foods or serving the, the, or changing the serving sizes or changing the frequency of consumption, what is easier for you? So there is a sort of negotiation between the participants and the dietitian. In PREDIMED Plus, this was the, 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 the biggest challenge was losing weight and keeping the weight lost for, uh, in the long term. So we intensified the contacts with the dietitian. During the first year, there were, they had three contacts with the dietitian every month. And after the, for the second year and so on, they have, uh, and further on, they have only two contacts per month. One contact by phone, another contact either in a group session or in a face-to-face -face interview. And another big, big challenge was the pandemic, the lockdown. So this was terrible. So, but we fortunately survived the pandemic. We have all the contacts with a group by Zoom, uh, uh, streaming, online sessions. So we needed to be very creative in order to overcome difficulties imposed by the lockdown. But uh, this, I think that this has been a common problem for every uh, ongoing trial. Do you agree, Mark? Um, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think um, that makes um, a lot of sense. I mean, actually, I mean, um, uh, Aline is one of our PhD students. She's actually helping us set up an intervention here at IARC, um, where we have um, adherence to the um, cancer um, prevention um, recommendations among people going through the, the French Colour to Cancer Screening Programme. Um, so it's been challenging. We, we actually were um, uh, a bit um, hindered by COVID um, and we're, we're severely delayed now because they stopped all screening in, in France during that period. But, um, but maybe, Miguel, we might might um, seek some of your advice on, on this because it's been very challenging to get this going. The, the training and the motivation of the dietitian is the, the yeah. first priority. You need to do a, a lot of training of the dietitians and a lot of motivation. And when you have motivated and well-trained dietitians, uh, you can get a, a contrast between the intervention and the control. And sometimes uh, in some previous trials, they did a lot in the control group. I will not recommend to do a lot in the just usual care. 
because otherwise the, the contrast is very modest, very tiny, and you will not find any impact of the intervention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alina, you want to read the, the next one? Because there are plenty. Yeah. Uh, from I think the, next, the next one is Sadela Castelló from my team. She's uh, um, saying, while well, she's congratulating you and saying that maybe the, the, the high incidence in Spain for, for rectal cancer may be related with the latest uh, implementation of the screening program. Uh, sorry, Adela, I'm not reading. I am just explaining it. And I take this opportunity to tell you that uh, uh, Adela in our group uh, uh, carried out, we had a multicenter study, case control study, and we in the control group of women is for breast cancer uh, with clinicians working in, 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 in breast cancer. In the control group, she explored the, the dietary patterns that were already present in our, in our society. We have validated these patterns in, in, in other groups. One of them we call it the Mediterranean pattern. It's not as, uh, it doesn't fit as best with the recommendations that Miguel Angel pointed out, but it's what we observed. It was the closest to this uh, kind of pattern. The other one, was the uh, Western pattern, that is well, just the Western Spanish pattern. And we, uh, the interesting thing is that we uh, also found an intermediate pattern that was, we, we label it le, the prudent pattern because it was like uh, from people who, who wanted to avoid fats, uh, telling you as uh, just summary. So we found a very clear relationship with breast cancer uh, with the Western country. We have also, uh, found the same uh, association with other other tumors that we in, in in a different case control study, a big one that we carried out in in the fever with uh, uh, Manolis Cogevinas and myself. We are the coordinators, so we have the same uh, uh, increasing uh, risk uh, with the Western pattern. The Mediterranean pattern on, only seem to to be protective uh, in people who have a great deal of, uh, of adherence. So it's not a, the dose response is not so linear. But the interesting thing is that the prudent pattern didn't <laughs> show any association with any tumor. So one interesting thing in our, well, we were using uh, uh, food frequency Questionnaires, as uh, you, you mentioned, Mark, about the, the problems of exposure assessment with this type of uh, to measure uh, diet is, is, is a challenge. But in the in the prudent pattern, we had a, 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 one of the foods that were was highlighted there were juices, and in our uh, food frequency questionnaire, didn't distinguish between fresh squeezed juices that are here in Spain are very common, particularly in some areas that produce oranges. I mean, um, and we couldn't distinguish between fresh squeeze and the, bot the bottle ones. So because you work in the IGF uh, uh, pathway and so on, I would like to, to know what, what both of you, your idea regarding uses and compare with the consumption of food, of, of sorry, of fruit because among children here is, is going to be, is, is coming very trendy to give the, the, the child a, a bottle of, of juice instead of, of a piece of fruit. Sorry, I think that you, you could understand me. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, juices, they're good in some ways. So if they're fresh, they've got lots of, I know, vitamins and um, I know, other potential phytochemicals, but they're also very rich in sugar, um, which... Um, I, I don't know. I mean, certainly up the kind of more processed juices, I would be very aware of with that kind of they're full of full of sugar. Um, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've not seen any good studies yet looking at um, kind of juices per se and impact on. Um, yeah, you mentioned IGF. I mean, I don't know kind of if any studies looking at kind of metabolic impact of these sorts of drinks. Um, but um, I, I know. Um, uh, there is a growing interest in kind of um, artificially sweetened drinks and, and, and beverages in general. Um, I think there's something that's been kind of overlooked for many years. Uh, um, people have been very focused on food, um, but actually people are getting a lot of calories from, from what they're drinking as well. 
Um, so um, I think certainly this will be an area where there's kind of there will be some in research in, in, in coming years. If, if cohorts are, are good at collecting that kind of data and distinguishing, as you say, between um, fresh juices versus those which are um, kind of artificially sweetened or um, full, full of, um, yeah, full of um, ad added sugars. Um, but yeah, that's no, an interesting point. I'm very much interested in coffee, actually. I think um, there's a lot of interesting data now coming out on coffee and health benefits and um, most cohorts around, around the world show that people who are drinking more coffee tend to have a lower risk of certain chronic diseases. Um, and yeah, there's actually a study that just, that just came out this week, I think in UK Biobank, showing the same as what we see in Epic. I mean, it's really intriguing. Is it, is it, is it, there, is there something bioactive in coffee that's um, conferring health benefits or is it a correlate or I mean, we need, to, we need some trials on coffee, but they're actually very difficult to do. I mean, I don't you think, Miguel, whether that's going to be feasible, but... Um, I have thought a lot about uh, a trial on coffee. It is challenging. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy. Uh, I think that in coffee, you have a lot of polyphenols. In fact, in some epi nutritional epidemiology studies, uh, the, the biggest uh, source of polyphenols of phenolic compounds is coffee. Not the, in uh, people following the Mediterranean diet because you have a lot of polyphenols in fruits, vegetables, uh, olive oil, wine, but in, in other uh, patterns, the, 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 the biggest uh, source of uh, phenolic compounds is coffee. And regarding the fruit juices, um, results in uh, large epidemiologic studies are mixed. I think that a single element of the diet is very difficult to, to ascertain, to have a, a strong answer for a single element, providing just a, a very, very small amount of the total calories. But I definitely think and recommend, um, uh, I think that, that uh, it is a very bad idea to get all only basically the water and the sugar for, from a fruit. You have many, many interesting elements, including fiber, micronutrients that you are losing when you squeeze uh, an orange, even if it is a natural juice. Because for example, the white skin of the orange, I don't know the, the name in English, in Spanish we call it albedo. Uh, okay. This is the it contains a lot of uh, interesting antioxidant and anti-inflammatory components. So you are losing a lot of interesting compounds if instead of eating the orange, you squeeze it and just retain the liquid part with uh, a lot of sugar, despite it is natural. But uh, in fact, in our British Medical Journal paper in the same cohort of ultra-processed foods, and uh, total mortality, we included uh, fruit juices in the uh, fourth category of the NOVA classification. They are ultra processed hmm? because many of the uh, fruit juices that we are consuming in Spain are bottle juices or in Tetra Brick. So uh, they have a lot of processing. They have additives very often. So they have a lot of chemicals. So <laughs> uh, I recommend, I strongly recommend the natural fruit, not processed at all, that you see the fruit, you eat everything that it is uh, beneficial in the, in the uh, piece of fruit. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Beatriz Perez Gomez from our team also, she is uh, writing, regard of the two metabolites until now, you think they are more useful to help to further define dietary patterns or to help to deep into the biological pathways that may connect foods and disease, and in general, which is the half-life of metabolites, you have a clue of the window of exposure they explore? Yeah, very good question, and um, <laughs> not, I could probably talk about this all morning. Um, so I think metabolites, they, they, they can be useful for, I mean, it depends on the metabolite. You do have metabolites which are um, derived solely from from the food, which could then be used for identifying um, uh, consumption of that food. Um, there are metabolites which um, might reflect a metabolic response to certain foods. So for example, that, that alcohol biomarker I, I presented, um, that's not actually found in alcoholic drinks. It's actually a metabolic product of alcoholic alcohol consumption and it relates to glutathione metabolism. Um, but that there, there's something about that metabolite which seems to reflect uh -huh. It reflects alcohol drinking, but then it seems to be strongly related to development of liver and pancreatic cancer. 
Um, so I think again that these sorts of approaches can identify, um, yeah, uh, the exposure, the, the response to the exposure, but then it can also be useful for identifying kind of underlying mechanistic pathways. I think it really depends on the, the metabolite. I mean, I would say that these sorts of metabolomic studies, I think we're really at the very beginning of um, uh, their utility. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential for, for this type of approach, but it requires, um, they're, they're very technologically heavy and also you need very good biochemists and people who understand me metabolism to work with. Otherwise, um, you, you, you just get this long list of metabolites which are associated with an exposure or a disease and then it's hard to know what to, to do with that. So I think it's, it's crucial really to have the right kind of technology in place, work very well with biostatisticians who understand this kind of data and also the follow-up, um, thinking about kind of um, causal pathways, working with biochemists. I think that's where we get the maximal um, use out of these, these kinds of data. Um, the second point about half-life, again, this depends on the metabolite um, because I mean, there are thousands and thousands of thousand metabolites which you can measure in blood. Some have half-life sort of literally a, a few seconds, some hang around for, for weeks or maybe months. Um, so um, again, I think having an understanding of, of the biochemistry and, and how these metabolites are formed and then kind of the, the balance between their kind of um, catabolism and anabolism, I think is a really um, Im important. So, and there's, there's some good methodological studies now looking at um, half-lives and metabolites. So I think when, when interpreting your results, it's important to know, um, yeah, the half-life and how long uh, they kind of hang around in, 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 in blood for, but that's a bigger question, but it's quite complex. Yes, I agree. I agree with, with what Mark has just said. Um, it depends on also on the fluid where you're measuring the metabolites. It is different in plasma than in urine. Uh, for example, if you if if you measure in urine the the biomarkers of food consumption, the half life will be shorter. Um, and and also, I think that we will not forget. We should not forget the traditional methods of the FFQ. They are com Complementary. So okay. you need to take into account both sources of information and you will obtain um, more accurate response when you have both sources at the same time. For me, it has been surprising to, to find uh, such a strong correlation between the metabolomic signature of the Mediterranean diet and the uh, responses to the 14 item score, there is a very simple approach to measure adherence to a diet. And we, we published this in the European Heart Journal uh, together with a group of, of Harvard. Uh, Julie was the first author. Uh, and it was surprising not only the high correlation between the metabolomic signature and the 14 item score, but also the prediction, as Mark has also shown, the prediction for future events, cardiovascular events, with the metabolomic signature, even after adjusting for the self-reported 14 items. So, and also it was replicated in independent cohorts. So I think that metabolomics has a lot of future for nutritional epidemiology, but they need to, they, they need to be complemented with the traditional methods of uh, dietary assessment the usual dietary assessment tools, especially if you use repeated measurements of diet with food frequency questionnaire repeated every four years, every five years or so on. In this uh, regard, we have another question here in the chat from Bernadette Chimera. She, she says, thank you so much for the two enlightening presentations. My question is uh, to Dr. Gunter, Gunter, sorry, what would you say are the common challenges you face in establishing metabolic causal pathways within your studies, and in particular, key areas that one should pay closer attention to? Yeah, it's a big, another good question that we could probably talk for hours about. Um, it's actually very difficult to establish causal pathways, particularly in these sorts of observational designs. I mean, this is where we need, firstly, to, to, to replicate the findings, in a, maybe in um, at least one other cohort, but then also think about other approaches for ascertaining causality. So for example, um, Mendelian anonymization can be useful in some respects. So using genetic correlates of the metabolites, which um, when you look at them in relation to, to cancer should be free of some of the kind of aspects of confounding that we find in observational studies. I mean, we, we've, we've been trying to do MR on metabolites for cancer and it's actually very challenging because there's a lot of pleiotropy. 
So many of the genetic variants which are correlated with a particular metabolite are also correlated with many other metabolites. Um, because, because of the, the nature of metabolism, you have an enzyme um, which um, is upstream um, from a particular metabolite, but that um, it's also um, um, influences other, other metabolites downstream. Um, and there's also um, a wide degree of pleiotropy across different enzymes and genes which control metabolism. So I think, I think MR is better for, for things like proteomics, where you have a particular protein which is linked, where a variant, a variant, variant in um, the gene linked to that protein is, is measurable. But for metabolites, I think it's quite challenging. So we've had some limited success applying MR to um, metabolites. Um, I think... I think generating robust associations within multiple cohorts and then um, going forward and working with experimental groups to, to try to understand. I mean, that, that's the approach that we're taking. I mean, we, we see some really interesting findings now in histidine and colorectal cancer. I didn't present that today. Uh, but, um, in both EPIC and UK Biobank, people who've got high levels of histidine have a lower risk of colorectal cancer. Um, and just by chance, conversation I had with a, a research scientist in the US, I mean, they've got a whole program of work around histidine metabolism and the gut microbiota, and um, I'm working with them now, um, where, where our observational findings very much align with what they're seeing in experimental models. I think that that, that kind of triangulation brings a degree of um, uh, understanding of, of, of causality. Um, so, yeah, I would say that get, getting the best out of the observational data um, replication and then working probably with experimental groups um, to to kind of causally validate associations. I think that's probably the way to go. But it, it's not easy. It, it's a lot of work, and um, we can't we can't always do it. But that's the limitation we face. Do you want to add something? No, I, I agree. I agree. The replication and the consistency of findings is also very important. I think that the combination of Mendelian randomization with metabolomics can help a lot, but it is not so easy to identify the, the pathways, the causal pathways. I think, Miguel, the, the, the results you sent on that compound in virgin olive oil really intriguing. I mean, um, maybe when I see you next week, we can talk about that a bit more. I mean, it might be interesting to look for that in some of our data because we have a lot of untargeted metabolomics data now in EPIC related to colorectal cancer, for example. And I don't know whether you think it could be found in... Well, the, 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 usual, the usual thing that you can find uh, from uh, olive oil are metabolites of hydroxide or salt because you cannot you cannot find oleocanthal in urine directly, but you can uh, study them metabolites. We published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition some years ago, the association between um, a metabolite of hydroxide tyrosol, the homovanillyl alcohol uh, that was found in urine with uh, almost 2000 participants of PREDIMED and it showed a, a strong inverse association in the long term with the incidence of uh, cardiovascular disease endpoints. So uh, this was published in the, by Rafael de la Torre, was the, the, the main author in that paper by, by the PREDIMED group in AJCN. Uh, so uh, this is a, a, an approach that, uh, that you can use. And now we, we received this uh, very good news of uh, an NIH grant. We, it was funded uh, starting last month. March to study uh, multifluid metabolomics combining urine and plasma, uh, specifically for trying to identify metabolites of the uh, of the phenolic compounds in uh, olive oil and storage in olive oil in relationship with uh, cardiovascular disease. So this is a, a a grant, a project that we are starting now, together with with Frank Hu and Rosa Lamuela. We are the multiple PI, the three of us, and and we will work on, on this uh, urine samples. So uh, we will deal on this uh, next uh, next Thursday in Madrid. So, <laughs> I will. There is just one question that we missed. It's from Elena Ursilai, and maybe that could be like a last uh, discussion. It's more for policy making. She would say that stronger messages need to be spread into society, but clear recommendations or alarms in food labels may help as well, and not forget increasing taxes on healthy, ultra-processed food. I mean, 
ultra processed food is is eaten by people that don't have much money. So I don't know. What do you think about this? Well, Miguel, you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I I said before that we need to be more radical in public health. So uh, and uh, in in these books that I have written. Uh, I claim for uh, an Arwin for using the taxes that are uh, now applied to soda drinks and uh, there is some prospect that they are going to be applied to other junk foods to uh, cut the cost of healthy foods such as uh, olive oil, tree nuts, fruits and vegetables that in this uh, very, very bad situation that we are in the current economy, uh, the, the highest increases in prices are for precisely for olive oil, fruits and vegetables. So this is a harm for the poor sectors of the population. So I, I, of course, I, I need that I need to say this very very strong message for the authorities for the for for uh, for using for structural measures of using the ta the, the the incomes that the government uh, collects with the taxes to unhealthy foods to subsidize healthy foods. Of course, this is a, a very interesting structural measure in public health. In fact, when we designed the PREDIMED, we were thinking in this because we were providing for free virgin olive oil and tree nuts. And this was an indirect message, huh? not only education, you need to use always in public health structural measures. Yes. And of course, uh, there is some, uh, some uh, a strong need to, re to, to um, put in the correct place olive oil in the uh, front label system for packaged foods, hmm? because nowadays it is in the, in the third level with the strongest evidence that we have using uh, randomized trials and all the epidemiology studies of large cohorts showing this advantage. And, uh, and I don't understand why it is in that place because uh, the, the rationale sometimes is only the, the nutritional composition, uh, only looking at nutrients and not looking at the scientific evidence. So for me, this is uh, also a need, of course. It's quite depressing when you can, it's much cheaper to buy very ultra, very um, nutritionally poor ultra processed foods versus um, fruits and vegetables, particularly in a country like Spain, where you, you, you grow a lot of fruits and vegetables there. Um, but unfortunately, we face a very powerful, um, yeah, industry that's trying to, um, yeah, push against these sorts of recommendations. I know um, the Nutri-Score, um, that's been quite controversial in Spain, I think, because I think olive oil is um, not ranked as the highest. Um, yeah. uh, it, it's kind of quite poorly ranked, isn't it? Um, which um, shows the limitations of, of Nutri-Score. I mean, I think these sorts of scores can be useful, a useful guide. But I think for certain foods, as you say, Miguel, there needs to be a more science-based rationale and why that particular food's been, been, been ranked to that. Level. I mean, I think the certain processed foods, nutri score is very good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it requires a, um, a kind of more yeah, critical evaluation of how it's being applied to different foods. Yes. Okay. It, it only is. serves to compare uh, foods in the same category. So mm. it's not useful just to compare foods belonging to different categories because it's taking into account the composition in fat and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's going to, to be 12 o'clock in the noon, so it's, it has been very, very interesting. I had other topics there, but probably we will have a second round next year. So thank you very much. You have been very kind to accept the, 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 the challenge to, to share <laughs> your, <laughs> all your experience with us. And the waning in the audience has been very low. We, we started with 80 people, almost 80, and we are now 50. So thank you very much to everybody that is listening to us there. Um, well, we finish here. Thank you very much.